Hi there, and welcome to Lost in Literature. Uh, I'll be starting the, uh, you know, recording from where I left off last week. And uh, you know that Caesar was proceeding, you know, with along with a crowd of people and Antony to witness the Feast of Lupercal, where a whole lot of young men were going to run this race. And um, as you know, Caesar requested Antony to touch Calpunia as he ran, because um, Caesar and Calpunia were childless. And Caesar really wanted an heir so badly. So the Romans believed that during this race of Lupercal, where young men, in fact, they ran naked, uh, you know, and they held a kind of lash made of leather in their hand. And as they ran, many childless women deliberately stood on their path and they would wave this lash. And if it touched the woman, it was believed that by the Romans that she would soon bear a child. It would make her fertile. So uh, Caesar requested Antonio to do so when he ran. So that's where we're going to start today. Caesar had gone away with a whole lot of his followers and uh, Cassius snatched this opportunity to talk to Brutus. He wanted to know where Brutus's loyalties were, whether um, he was uh, loyal enough to Caesar and would not join the conspirators or if there was a chance that Cassius could roping, rope him in in the name of, uh, you know, patriotism and loyalty to Rome. So this is where we are going to start and I hope to go fairly rapidly because it's a long part. So do stay with me. All right, um, Brutus, another great general, shout, I do believe that these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped on Caesar. So Brutus uh, and Cassius are standing around together. Brutus has not joined the rest of the crowd to watch uh, the runners during this Feast of Lupercal. Um, so he says, you know, there are shouts, cheering, applauses coming along uh, from the crowd. And Brutus kind of surmises, perhaps they could be um, appreciation expressed towards Caesar, right? He was just back from um, his conquest, and he had also defeated Pompey and not only defeated him, but also killed him. So Cassius says, why man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus. He bestrides, he stands, you know, with his feet planted firmly on both the sides of Rome, spanning the entire Rome, uh, just like uh, the statue of Colossus, which was, uh, you know, dedicated to Apollo. And this particular statue, it stood, um, you know, in the harbor of Rhodes and uh, ships uh, could pass under it and people could also, you know, they were just, uh, you know, uh, tiny specks, the people in comparison to the statue of Rhodes. So this is the kind of comparison 
that uh, Cassius makes. He says, my God, Caesar seems to have spanned, uh, got the entire Rome within his grasp. He's straddling the world of Rome. And we petty men, chota mota, small men, are walking under his huge legs and we peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Why dishonorable graves? Because, uh, you see, uh, if they did not do anything to save Rome from monarchy dictatorship, then their graves would be that much dishonorable. All right, so that's the reference to dishonorable graves. Men at some times are masters of their fates. There are times when men are in control of the events happening. All right, they can shape the path of the future and in this case of a particular nation. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. We can blame ourselves for whatever is going on at Rome, that we are underlings, underlings, subordinate creatures, that we don't have the guts to challenge and stand up against Caesar. Um, what should be in that Caesar, Brutus and Caesar? And yet, what should be in that Caesar that he has overtaken Brutus? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Why? See, he's trying to ignite feelings of um, jealousy, envy in Brutus. All right? That's what Cassius is smartly doing here. He says, why should the name be sounded more than yours? Write them together. Yours is as fair a name. It looks equally good. Sound them. Speak them out. Call them out loud. And it doth become the mouth as well. Weigh them. It is as heavy. If you were to weigh them, both the names are equally weighty. Important. Conjure with them. All right. Um, try to bring, uh, raise spirits from the altar world, and Brutus's name would also uh, inspire a spirit to come in. So that is how. Uh, Brutus's name was equally powerful like Caesar's. All right? Now, in the name of all gods at once, upon what meat does the Caesar feed? What on earth does he eat that he has grown so great? Tell me, there is no difference between Brutus and Caesar. Both are noblemen and both are men liked by the crowds. Then why is it that Caesar has grown so huge? Age, thou art shamed. Age, you are in disgrace. Because... Um, where am I? <laughs> All right. Age, thou art shamed, Rome. You have lost the breed of noble bloods. You have literally lost men who belong to the noble stock for which Rome was famous. And these men would have stood up for the Republic of Rome. When, when, thereby an age since the great flood, but it was famed with more than with one man. So he says, when did an age ever occur when there was just one man 
ruling over Rome, particularly after the great flood. Now, the great flood reference is to uh, Zeus, all right, who created this flood to flush out all the disreputable, uh, useless men around the place. Now, these men had to be exterminated, all right? So, that, that is the reference here. But ever since that, Rome has been a republic and always more than one man has had a say in the governance of Rome. It has been a democrat democracy in the sense that freedom of speech was prevalent. All right? When could they say till now that talked of Rome, that a wide vox encompassed but one man? When did it ever so happen that the wide uh, pieces of Rome, that this huge, uh, you know, nation like uh, Rome, uh, this huge place like Rome could only boast of one man, all right, who would rule her. Now it is, now is it Rome indeed and room enough? Now he's playing with Rome and room. So is it Rome now and is there room when there is in it but only one man? Do you really call Rome uh, a big place? No, certainly not. It has space only for one man. Oh, you and I have heard our fathers say, there was a Brutus once that would have broke the eternal devil to keep his state in Rome. Once upon a time, there was an ancestor, a forefather of Brutus called Junius, no, Lucius Junius Brutus. And this forefather was somebody who would have tolerated even a devil if it meant getting rid of a king who wanted to establish monarchy. Such a man was the forefather and he was elected by the people as one of the consuls in Rome. And these consuls, mind you, they were elected by people. They had a lot of power in the governance of the country. Brutus, that you do love me, I'm nothing jealous. I have no doubt about it. What you would work me to, I have some aim. I have an understanding, I have a fair idea of what you would have me do. And yes, I do have some goals, some ambition in that direction. How I have thought of this and of these times, I shall recount hereafter. From now on, I'll share with you what I think of these times what my true feelings are. But for the present, I would not. So with love, I might entreat you, beg you, be any further moved. I don't want to discuss this matter any further. What you have said, I will consider. Definitely, I will uh, think about it. What you have to say, I will hear with patience and I will find a suitable time when we can hear each other and exchange our, our views on such high important matters as these. So till then my noble friend, chew upon this, think about this, Brutus had rather be a villager. I prefer to be a backward villager rather than to be known as a son of Rome under such conditions as these when we are about to lose our free thinking, free speaking, republic, democracy. All right, I'd rather be a villager 
a totally backward, uneducated man than have anything to do with this. Cassius, I'm glad that my weak words have struck but thus much show of fire from Brutus. So he's very happy. He says, I'm glad, honestly, I'm glad that uh, you've given me some levy of, uh, you know, understanding you and discussing this matter with you. Now, at this point, you have Caesar returning. So he's coming along and Brutus says, oh, the games are done and Caesar's returning. So Cassius says, as they pass by, pluck Casca by the sleeve and he will, after his sour fashion in his own bitter way, tell you what had proceeded worthy note today. He will tell us what has happened today. I'll do so. So Brutus says, yeah, I'll do so. But look, you Cassius, hey, just take a look at that. There is this angry spot glowing on Caesar's brow. Looks like something has upset him. There is the spot of anger on his forehead. And all the rest of the crowd along with him are looking like chidden train as if they have been rebuked, scolded, admonished for whatever stand they've taken. Kalpunia's cheek is pale, devoid of colour and Cesaro looks with such ferret and such fiery eyes. So there is Cesaro and look at his eyes, it's all bloodshot and ferocious looking and that's the way we have seen him at the Capitol when he's crossed, when he's opposed by people in any discussion. Now, what is the Capitol? The Capitol is a building in which the state legislative body meets and the legislative body is the lawmakers. All right, so that is where they would convene and discuss policies, matters of importance. All right, Cassius, Casca will tell us what the matter is. Caesar, now you have a little bit here about, you know, Caesar. Caesar is having a small exchange with Antony. Antonius, Caesar, Caesar. Let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed with smooth hair and such as sleep at night. So people who are fat, prosperous looking and who have their hair combed. Now such people are in uh, control of their lives and quite satisfied. They don't have any other extraneous thoughts or ambitions in their mind. And the fact that their hair is all smoothly combed shows that they are um, well groomed enough and they've time to groom themselves and they're not overly worried about anything else, all right, except the daily matters. So he says, let me have such men who sleep peacefully at night. But look at that Cassius, yon Cassius. He has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. The guy is given to too much thinking. Such men are dangerous. Now Cassius looks as if he could do with something. Put him in the company of people who are doing better than him. And he is quite envious, jealous. And he wants to be one upon them. And such men are really dangerous. Antony, fear him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. He's a noble Roman and well given. So Antony kind of consoles Caesar. He says, oh, please, don't worry about this guy. He's, he's a good man. He's a good Roman. And uh, he's kindly disposed and friendly. And you can see Antony here, he is a, a very fair man. All right, Caesar. Would he were fatter? I wish he was fatter. But I fear him not. I don't fear him. So that is Caesar. He has quite a grand opinion of himself. So he says, I don't fear him. Yet, if my name were liable to fear, 
I do not know the man I should avoid as soon as at spare Cassius, but if at all I was the kind of man who was subject to fear, I don't know any other person whom I would avoid than Cassius. He reads too much. He is a great observer. He observes people. And he looks through the deeds of men, the action of men. He is very perceptive. He is capable of judging the action of people. He is not a sport-minded person like you, Antony. He hears no music. He doesn't have any interest in uh, you know, fine arts like music. Seldom does he smile and smiles in such a sort as if he mocked himself and scorned his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. So this man hardly ever smiles and if at all he smiled. He literally mocked at himself, derided himself for even deigning to smile at something. Such men as he, never they are never at heart's ease while they behold a greater than themselves. People like Cassius are never ever at ease. If they see another man doing better than himself, such men like him, come on my right hand for this uh, year is dead. So come on my right hand, right side. All right? Ah, but before that, Caesar affirms, I'd rather tell thee what is to be feared, Antony, than what I fear. I'll tell you what you have to fear than what I fear because I am always Caesar beyond fear. Come on my right hand. For this year is death. The next breath after he says that I am Caesar with such an air of greatness. In the next breath he talks about his disability. So he says, come on my right. All right. For this year is death. And tell me truly, what, what thinkest thou of him? So now you can hear that, uh, you know, the trumpets and Caesar goes away with uh, Antony. But Casca stays behind. Uh, Casca, you pull me by my cloak. Would you speak with me? Brutus, I, Casca, tell us what chanced today that Caesar looked so sad. Casca, you were with him, were you not? Why are you asking me? Weren't you with him? Aren't you his friend? I'm sure you were with him. Why on earth are you asking me? Brutus, I should not have asked Casca what had chanced and I should not then have asked Casca. I wasn't with Caesar. Brutus confirms that by saying, I would not have then asked you. Casca, why? <laughs> there was a crown offered him and being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand. Thus, he shoved it off. And then the people fell a shouting. All the people started yelling. What was the second noise for? Why, for that too. They shouted thrice. What was the last cry for? Why, for that too. Brutus, was the crown offered him thrice? I marry, was it? And he put it by thrice, every time gentler than the other. And at every putting by, mine honest neighbor shouted, he's really mocking his so-called honest neighbors, whom he considers very simple-hearted and easily taken by Caesar's ploy. So there you have Casca describing the scene. Antony offered Caesar the crown three times and three times Caesar rejected it, pushed it away. But each time he was more reluctant to let it go. And some of the people standing near Casca protested. 
you know, they didn't want Caesar to resist the crown. Who offered him the crown? Why, Antony, tell us the manner of it, gentle Casca. Hmm, I can as well be hanged as tell the manner of it, says Casca. Now, Casca is really talking about the state of Rome. He says, I'd rather not tell you anything because I'll find myself hanged, executed literally, because that is the way dictatorship is slowly rising in Rome. Okay? I did not mark it. Honestly, I didn't notice anything. It was mere foolery. I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown, and yet it was not a crown neither. It was one of those coronets. Now, coronets are uh, a relatively simple, you know, version of a crown, and it's offered to people of less authority. And as I told you, he put it by at once. For all that, to my thinking, he would fain have had it. He would gladly have kept it. Then Antony offered it to him again and then he put it by again. But to my thinking, he was very loath to lay his finger off it. He was very reluctant to take his finger off it. And then Antony offered it the third time and he put it the third time by. Still, as he refused it. So again, third time, he pushed it off. But very reluctantly, he wanted it. And as he refused it, the rabblement, the crowd, hooted and clapped their chapped rough hands and threw up their sweaty nightcaps and uttered such a deal of stinking breath. They released so much um, uh, stinky breath that... Um, uh, it almost suffocated, choked Caesar because he fainted and Casca didn't dare to laugh because if he opened his um, mouth, he too would take in all that polluted, stinky air. Now what we have here, if you notice, do note it sharply, is the reaction of the crowds, uh, particularly when Caesar kept refusing the uh, coronet. You must remember that Flavius and Mariulus had gone around earlier disrobing all Caesar's statues, taking away the decoration. So now the crowds were kind of, people were puzzled. All right? They didn't know whom to attach their allegiance to. Because Marilus and Flavius had done this, a number of uh, people did not know whom they owed their loyalty to. So every time Caesar refused the coronet, some people booed and some people cheered him. And uh, altogether, it was a very confused uh, crowd making all that noise. All right? So that is why there were boos from the crowd. And perhaps that was one of the reasons why Caesar fainted. Cassius, but soft, I pray you, what? Did Caesar swound? Did he really faint? Casca, he fell down in the marketplace and foamed at the mouth and was speechless. Brutus, it is very possible, likely, he hath the falling sickness. So Cassius could not believe that Caesar had actually fainted. So he said, oh my God, did he really faint? Is that true? And Brutus says, yes. It is perfectly possible because Caesar had the falling sickness. Caesar was a victim of epileptic fits. All right? And quite often, in moments of tension, Caesar fainted. So Cassius says, now look at the twist. 
Cassius is giving to the falling sickness mentioned by Brutus. He says, no, Brutus, Caesar doesn't have that falling sickness. But you and I, an honest Casca here, we have the falling sickness because we are the fallen ones refusing to save Rome. We are not even trying to save this republic of Rome where democracy thrived. And now Caesar is uh, becoming popular and soon he is going to ascend the uh, throne, all right, the highest um, power is soon going to be given to him and he is going to rule and boss over us and take away all our freedom. So we are the ones falling here, all right, Casca, I know not what you mean by that. So Casca is telling, I don't know what the hell you mean by that. But I'm sure Caesar fell down. That was for sure. He fell down. And if the ragtag people did not clap him and hiss him, boo him down, according as he pleased and displeased them, so there was certainly this mixed reaction from the people. As, as they used to do the players in the theater, I am no true man. Brutus, what did he say when he came into himself? What did he say when he regained consciousness? Casca, Mary, before he fell down, when he perceived the common herd was glad he refused the crown, he plucked me up the doublet and offered them his throat to cut. So before he lost his consciousness, when he noticed when you observed that the crowd there was quite relieved that he had refused the crown. He became um, upset and even more dramatic. So he just threw open his jacket, the doublet, and offered his throat to the crowd and asked them to cut it, meaning to say, he was ready to sacrifice his life for them. And I had been a man of any occupation if I had been a workman. Unfortunately, I'm not. But had I been a workman, part of the crowd, if I would not have taken him at a word, I would, I might go to hell among the rogues. But if I had been part of the common crowd and if I hadn't taken him up on his word and slit his throat, let me be counted as a rogue and not as a person who is for Rome as a democracy. All right? And so he fell. That's when he fell. And when he came to himself again, he said, if he had done or said anything amiss, anything wrong, he desired their worships to think that it was his infirmity, disability. So when he uh, came to himself, he told the crowd that, okay, if I've said something to upset you, please ascribe it to my physical disabilities. Three or four wenches, women, uh, where I stood, where Casca stood, cried, alas, good soul, and forgave him with all their hearts. <laughs> but you don't have to take them all that seriously, because even if Caesar had stabbed their mothers, they would have reacted in the same way. So it doesn't matter, you know, that he managed to wrench some pity out of just two or three women beside him. Brutus. And uh, after that he came thus sad away. Oh, has he come after that? Casca, I. Cassius. Did Cesaro say anything? Cesaro... 
uh, is one of the conspirators. So, Cassius is keen to know what Cicero felt. Casca, I, he spoke Greek. I didn't understand a word of it. That's what he means. Because uh, Cicero was an expert in speaking Greek. So, Cassius says, to what effect? And Casca says, nay. And I tell you that I'll never look you in the face again. All right. So to what effect? So he says, look, if I were to make up, fabricate something and tell you, that's not true. I wouldn't be able to look at you in the face because honestly, I didn't understand a thing. But those who understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. But for me, my own part, it was pure Greek to me. Like we say when we can't understand something, we say, oh my God, that is pure Greek. I could tell you more news too. So now this man is bringing more news. Mariulus and Flavius for pulling scarves of Caesar's images for taking away all the decorations from Caesar's images, statues or whatever are put to silence. They have been executed and you can see a monarchy raising its ugly head here and literally taking authority in its hand to kill people who would rise up against such a government. So there you are, Mariulus and Flavius were put to death. All right, fare you well. There was more foolery yet, if I could remember it. Of course, things went on in this fashion. Cassius, will you sup with me tonight, Casca? No, I'm promised forth. Cassius, will you dine with me tomorrow? I, if I be alive and your mind hold and your dinner worth the eating. So look at him up front. He's telling, all right, tomorrow, yes, I'm free, but your dinner had better be a good one. Cash is good. I'll expect you then. Because he wanted to probe more deeply. Casca, do so. Farewell both. And he goes away. And Brutus says, my God, what a blunt fellow is this grown to be. Now, blunt in Shakespearean uh, language is someone a bit plain speaking and dull-witted and lacking in diplomacy. All right. So this guy has grown into such a such an undiplomatic, uh, plain uh, speaking kind of a fellow. And when he was young, he was very lively and intelligent. He was a quick-witted fellow when he was young. So Cassius says, don't get fooled by that. It's just an air he puts on. He is still pretty quick when it comes to execution of any bold plan. Right? Any noble enterprise. Casca will be the first person to act. However, he puts on this tardy form. Dull, stupid facade. This rudeness is only a sauce to his good wit. This is just uh, a kind of uh, put on act and uh, it adds a kind of flavor to whatever he is saying and it, uh, it uh, kind of makes the truth that he speaks uh, acceptable. All right? Uh, and people are able to digest it better. So Brutus say, uh, says, and so it is for this time, I'll leave you. Tomorrow, if you please to speak with me, I'll come home to you. Or if you will, come home to me and I'll wait for you. So Brutus is ready to talk more on this matter of Caesar becoming a tyrant. And now you have proof of it with Mariulus and Flavius dead. Cassius, I'll do so. Till then, 
think of the world. Well, Brutus, thou art noble. And Brutus has already gone away. And the next bit is straight away, uh, you know, to the, the audience to speak his true mind. And uh, the spotlight is totally on Cassius now. And he says, well, Brutus, thou art noble. You are truly noble. And yet I see thy honourable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. So he says you are truly an honourable man. And yet there are chinks in your nobility. Alright? Uh, because I can work on you influence you as if you are a metal in my hand to be shaped. So I can slowly bring you to my way of thinking. I have got that confidence after this exchange with you. Therefore, it is uh, honestly, it's very, very perceptive very ironic that Cassius says, read Brutus right. And he says, honestly, it is meet, which means suitable, that noble minds keep ever with their likes. So nobility must stick with nobility. All right? And that's something Brutus is not doing here because he is now possibly entertaining the idea of joining Cassius. Uh, for who so firm that cannot be seduced? So he says, uh, people must stick to their kind and not expose themselves to others. And in this case, Brutus listening to Cassius because who is so firm in their mind that they cannot be influenced by people who can influence them, as in the case of Cassius? Caesar doth bear me hard. Now he's really opening his heart to the audience. Cassius has a personal grudge against Caesar. Why? Because according to Cassius, Caesar didn't like him at all. But Caesar loved Brutus. And now he tells the audience very frankly, if I were Brutus now and he were Cassius, he should not humor me. So he says, now, let's pretend I am Brutus and he is Cassius. I'm not going to let me, uh, I'm not going to let him talk me into any kind of a plot with him. I'm not going to allow him to influence me. I would still be loyal to my friend Caesar, in which case had I been Brutus. And then he says, in any case, I will this night in several hands, using different kinds of handwriting, as if it has come from many citizens, uh, you know, uh, writings. I will throw in writings, little letters, as if they've come from different people, all tending to the great opinion that Rome holds of his name. Each letter now from some anonymous citizen would uh, uh, make Brutus think that Rome is indeed, the people of Rome indeed depend on him to save Rome. All right? Wherein obscurely, very indirectly, Caesar's ambition to become a dictator will be hinted at. And after this, let Caesar seat him sure. Oh, let him try sitting on that throne as a monarch because we will shake him. We are going to do it. We will shake him. Otherwise, we would be forced to endure days 
our days as slaves to Caesar. Rome will cease to exist as a democracy. So that's it from me for today. I hope Srija and Flying Colors, I do hope you get to listen to me. I have particularly done this for the students of Class 9 ICSE who have begun uh, doing uh, Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar and I hope my analysis of this particular scene makes it clear for you. Looking forward to have more of you subscribing to my channel Lost in Literature. Thank you for now and I'm signing off.